A verse-by-verse -verse study in the Book of Psalms, ESV, with Irv Rish, Chapter 31. What does Psalms Chapter 31 mean? David begins this psalm with a prayer for deliverance from his enemies and for guidance. He trusts in the Lord for stability, security, and protection. Everything, including David's life, is placed in God's care, Psalm 31 verses 1 to 5. Next, David praises God for the times when he experienced divine rescue. David shuns those who worship false gods, pointing to how the one true God answered his prayers. Because of that history, David is confident that God has placed him in a position of safety and stability, Psalm 31 verses 6 to 8. Even so, David still experiences hardships. His enemies plot and lie about him. Friends and neighbors turn their backs on him. As it would for anyone, this pushes David to exhaustion and tempts him to despair. Nevertheless, he trusts in the Lord and believes his entire life is controlled and guided by God's hand, Psalm 31 verses 9-15. In ancient figures of speech, a shining face represented happiness and approval. Hebrew thinking also used light as a symbol for truth and goodness. So, when David asks God to shine his face, he is asking for divine approval and blessing. This echoes the words God gave to Aaron to use when blessing Israel, Numbers 6 22 27. David prays that his scheming enemies be the ones to suffer loss and death, Psalm 31 verses 16 to 18. The psalm closes with expressions of amazement. God serves as a refuge of goodness for those who trust in Him. Those who follow the Lord will ultimately be rescued from all evil, including plots and accusations. Although David's natural fears made him feel alienated from the Lord, he testifies that the Lord heard his prayer. He concludes with an appeal to the Lord's people, knowing the Lord avenges the wicked. He encourages all who trust God to be purposeful, brave, and constant in their faith, Psalm 31 verses 19-24. Chapter Context David mentions dangers and enemies in this psalm. He may have been referring to besieged cities such as Keilah, 1 Samuel 23 verses 1-15, or Ziklag, 1 Samuel 30. Despite the plots of his enemies and abandonment by friends, David trusts in the Lord, receives an answer to his prayer, and encourages his fellow believers to love the Lord and be strong. This echoes themes also seen in Psalms 4, 25, and 71. Verse by Verse Verse 1. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge, let me never be put to shame, in your righteousness deliver me. David prays to the Lord, placing all his trust in God. The Hebrew phrasing implies that David is entirely depending on God for his safety, as would those who rest in a fortress or sanctuary. This appeal for security is based on the Lord's righteousness. Centuries earlier Abraham interceded for Sodom, saying, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Genesis 18 verse 25. David believes his plea will lead to a favorable answer, it's likely tied to David's role as the legitimate king of Israel. He reasons that his righteous Lord would not allow him to be put to shame. That phrase refers to defeat and loss, Psalm 25 verse 2. It is to David's credit that he understood the Lord's desire to protect his people. That desire does not mean God will never allow hardship, but believers can trust the Lord to do what is right. He safeguards those who trust in him. John 10 verse 29 quotes Jesus as promising, My Father, who has given, believers, to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. When trouble confronts a believer, he should trust and not tremble. Context Summary Psalm 31 verses 1-8 reveals David's trust in God to rescue him from his enemies. He detests idolaters but rejoices in the Lord's unfailing love. He praises the Lord for protecting him and allowing him to stand in a spacious place. These verses parallel similar psalms, in which David looks back on God's prior rescues in answer to prayer. Verse 2 
Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily, be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. David asks God to quickly answer his prayer. This suggests the urgency in which David needed the Lord's help. David's need of rescue may have been physical, emotional, spiritual, or all three. At many times in his life, he was under attack, 1 Samuel 23 verse 25, 2 Samuel 21 verse 15. These situations would make him physically and emotionally exhausted. Perhaps the enemy was closing in on him. When danger was close, it would be natural to wonder if the Lord still cared about him, Psalm 22 verse 1. And yet, God heard his prayer and met his need. This psalm reminds believers of God's personal relationship to his people. David personally takes refuge in the Lord and calls to him in the midst of need, trusting God will listen or incline his ear. Every believer in Jesus Christ has a personal relationship with God. John 1 verse 12 identifies all who receive Jesus as Savior as God's children. Galatians 4 verse 5 teaches that God sent His Son into the world to redeem us so that we might receive adoption as sons. The next verse explains, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Galatians 4 verse 6 We can all come to God in prayer, knowing He will hear us, Hebrews 4 verses 14-16, 1 Peter 3 verse 12. 1 John 5 verses 14 to 15. Phrases such as, Rock of Refuge. Verse 3. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name, S. sake you lead me and guide me. Along with the first two verses, Psalm 31 verses 1 to 2, a very similar statement is made in Psalm 71 verses 1 to 3. David's trust in God was strong. He refers to his Lord as, a rock of refuge, and, a strong fortress, Psalm 31 verse 2. Rock, from the Hebrew root word tsur, implies something like a massive boulder, or, rock, as a substance, rather than as a single stone. This imagery, used in the prior verse, Psalm 31 verse 2, suggests strength and stability, perhaps as one might picture a boulder or a mountainside. In blessing Joseph, Jacob called God, the stone of Israel, Genesis 49 verse 24. Moses, too, referred to God as, the rock, Deuteronomy 32 verses 4 and 15, 18. The term used in this verse is Selah, which leverages the idea of security and strength, as in a large cliff face. Stronghold and fortress are both translated from the same Hebrew root word. One can imagine a castle-like structure with thick stone walls. The main purpose of that structure is safety and stability, despite being attacked by an enemy. And yet, David looks to God for more than strength and protection. He also asks God to lead and guide him. Acting for God's name's sake means doing what furthers the Lord's will. David wasn't simply praising God for protection, but also for the Lord's holy guidance in his life. In the next verse, David continues blending literal military concepts with spiritual ideas by speaking of how this divine guidance keeps him away from enemy ambush, Psalm 31 verse 4. Verse 4. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. In this verse David praises the Lord for delivering him from his enemies. They had set an ambush for him, but it failed because God was David's refuge, Psalm 31 verses 1 to 3. Among the foes who tried to capture David were his own son Absalom and Absalom's followers. Absalom's rebellion against David lasted several months. Even David's counselor, Ahithophel, left David and joined Absalom and his followers, 2 Samuel 15, 18. Jesus, too, was betrayed by one of his followers. Jesus said at the Last Supper, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me, Matthew 26 verses 21 and 23. Verse 25 identifies Judas as the betrayer. Physical attacks and violence were part of the danger faced by David.
Yet there is a spiritual aspect to daily life, and attacks can come in spiritual form, as well. A believer today may feel that a net has been prepared to trap him, but God always provides a means of escape from temptation, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. When we follow God's leading, the enemy's net will stay empty, God is the believer's refuge as much as he was David's refuge. Verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit, you have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. The word, commit, means to give something to another, with trust that they will care for it. When we do this with money, in the bank, we refer to it as a, deposit. The Hebrew word used here relates to counting, in this context it means entrusting or placing. David is placing all his trust and reliance on God, committing, his spirit into the Lord's care. This statement comes as David praises God for keeping him safe from his enemies. Jesus made a similar statement from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Luke 23 verse 46. It's possible Jesus was citing this psalm of David. At least one of Christ's other notable remarks from the cross appears to be a quotation from the book of Psalms, Matthew 27 verse 46, Psalm 22 verse 1. When Stephen was martyred, he likewise said he was entrusting his living spirit to God, Acts 7 verse 59. David is not merely expression confidence in God, he is putting his entire existence into the care of the Lord. The Apostle Peter exhorts suffering Christians to commit their souls to God. He writes in 1 Peter 4 verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful Creator while doing good. This trust has been established because of the Lord's prior work in David's life. The God who delivered Israel from the hands of the Egyptians was able to deliver David from his foes. He is also able to deliver believers today. 2 Peter 2 verse 9. Verse 6. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols but I trust in the Lord. Terms like, hate, are used exclusively in reference to emotions in the modern world. As used in the Bible, hatred, for something is often mentioned as part of a contrast focused on behavior. This is the gist of Jesus' remark about loving him, in contrast to, hating, one's family. Luke 14 verse 26. The same is true when God refers to loving Jacob and hating Esau, Malachi 1 verses 2-3. The main idea is of preference, rather than of feelings. That's not to say David feels only positive emotions about those who worship idols. Still, this remark is more in line with his other comments, such as Psalm 26 verse 5 and Psalm 101 verse 3. David's devotion to God is contrasted with idolaters' vain worship of objects. Idols cannot hear or see, and they certainly cannot do anything for their worshippers. When Elijah confronted the idolaters who trusted in Baal, he issued a challenge. They were to build an altar and call on Baal. Elijah would also build an altar and call on the Lord. The one who answered by fire would be declared the true God whom the people of Israel should follow. Of course, Baal, a false god, could not answer his worshippers, but the true god answered with fire and consumed Elijah's sacrifice, 1 Kings 18. Today in modern society, few people worship idols of wood and stone, but many devote themselves to the worship of money, possessions, popularity, celebrities, fame, and success. Christians are admonished to worship only the true god and to keep themselves from idols, Exodus 20 verses 3-6, 1 John 5 verse 21. Verse 7. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction, you have known the distress of my soul. The Lord sees what every believer is experiencing. He sees each temptation and trial and invites every believer to approach His throne of grace in prayer to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need, Hebrews 4 verse 16. Although David experienced intense persecution, he retained his trust in the Lord. Because he had seen God's ability to work, Psalm 31 verse 8, even through hardship, Romans 8 verse 28, David was willing to rely on God instead of succumbing to despair.
he knew his suffering never happened without God's knowledge. God saw David's struggles and emotional pain. There is a subtle, yet crucial difference between happiness and joy. Happiness depends on favorable happenings, whereas joy depends upon a correct view of the Lord's character. Joy is tied to things like hope and faith. Because the Lord is all-knowing, all-powerful, kind, loving, and faithful, His people can experience joy amid adversity. Paul's letter to the Philippians is often called the Joy Epistle because of Paul's many references to joy and rejoicing. Yet, Paul was under arrest, chained, and guarded by Roman soldiers when he wrote Philippians. Verse 8 And you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy, you have set my feet in a broad place. David's willingness to trust God in challenging times, Psalm 31 verse 7, was rooted in prior experience. Despite repeated danger, the Lord had delivered David from his enemies. Foes had backed him into a tight place many times, but the Lord had delivered him and enabled him to experience security. The imagery of standing in a broad place contrasts with something like a narrow beam or a tightrope. Balancing on a thin edge is difficult, it's easy to feel stable when there's plenty of room to take a wide stance. As much as he trusted God's love, Psalm 31 verses 5 and 7, David bowed to God's sovereignty. He knew God could have allowed him to fall to his opponents. David doesn't claim that God had to provide rescue, he simply acknowledges that it was God who secured his rescue. This understanding is key for the believer, peace of mind can be enjoyed if one understands their life is in God's hands whether circumstances are rough or calm, Psalm 31 verse 7. Paul assured his readers at Rome that, for those who love God all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose, Romans 8 verse 28. Verse 9. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress, my eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. When someone appeals to God's grace, it means asking God for that which a person does not deserve. God's grace is expressed when He grants some benefit that we can't demand or expect. Here, David needs help because of his opponents, Psalm 31 verse 11. Symbolically, David speaks of his eyes failing because of grief. Intense weeping can make one's eyes uncomfortable, not to mention being blurred with tears. Likewise, his soul was afflicted as much as his body. Probably his troubles negatively impacted his spiritual life. It's possible that at some point, David focused too much on his trouble instead of on the Lord's ability to overcome that hardship. Whether this was connected to some overt sin on David's part, Psalm 31 verse 10, or simply his fallen human nature, Scripture does not say. Emotional stress can lead to physical problems. Physically, David was suffering. Although the Lord Jesus was sinless, Hebrews 4 verse 15, he, too, was, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53 verse 3. Also, like David, Jesus was sometimes physically exhausted. John 4 verse 6 reports that Jesus was wearied after his long journey into Samaria. Therefore, he sat down beside what had been Jacob's well. His death on the cross came faster than it did for those next to him, John 19 verses 31-33, likely because of the exhaustion of his prior beatings. Context Summary Psalm 31 verses 9 to 13 continues David's psalm of praise. He asks the Lord to be gracious to him. He mentions how sin leads to spiritual weakness, while also mourning how the deadly threat of his enemies has caused friends to abandon him. He hears rumors and conversations that inspire terror, knowing his foe's scheme against him. And yet, David will not succumb to despair, he chooses to trust in God, as the next passage shows. Verse 10. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing, my strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. The reference to iniquity here is obscure. At least some of David's troubles are blamed on this flaw. 
he does not identify any specific sin. Still, the presence of that sin led to spiritual weakness, and that led to physical weakness, Psalm 31 verse 9. To his credit, David was aware of his sin and its consequences. He openly asked for God's gracious lenience. David's plea here might be a way of confessing his sin while noting its devastating effects. In Old Testament thought, bones were the essence of a person's physical form. The same Hebrew term, etzem, means both bones and self or essence. Speaking of someone's bones referred to deep, critical issues, Psalm 38 verse 3, 102 colon 3. Bones are typically the longest-lasting part of a body, Genesis 50 verse 25, Exodus 13 verse 19. When bones are decomposing or weakening, it's a sign of terrible distress. It's possible this psalm was written around the same time as Psalm 32. In that song, David notes that when he kept silent about his sin of adultery, he was racked by weakness and misery, Psalm 32 verses 3-4. He recognized that God was convicting him of his sin and his strength vanished. However, when he confessed his sin, the Lord forgave him, Psalm 32 verse 5. Believers should not try to cover up their sins. Proverbs 28 verse 13 warns, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. However, the same verse promises, But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Verse 11. Because of all my adversaries I have become a reproach especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances, those who see me in the street flee from me. Being persecuted by one's enemies is difficult. It can be even harder, emotionally, to see friends turn away simply to avoid being caught in that same trouble. This seems to be what David had experienced. Either because of physical threats, 1 Samuel 19 verse 2, 22 verse 17, Psalm 54 verse 3, or slander, Psalm 31 verses 13 and 18, 38 verse 12, 59 colon 12, David's enemies caused his friends to turn their backs on him. What David describes here is an almost total rejection. Friends and neighbors are treating him like an object of fear and loathing. They avoid even associating with him in public. In modern English, acting as if another does not exist means the person is dead to them. In the next verse, David describes himself in a comparable way, Psalm 31 verse 12. He is as rejected as a broken and valueless container. In this and other psalms, David foreshadows the suffering of Jesus, who was also rejected. Isaiah 53 verse 3 prophesies concerning Jesus' sufferings, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised, and we esteemed him not. John 1 verse 11 says, He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Matthew 27 verses 27 to 31 reports the atrocious way the governor's soldiers treated Jesus when he was their prisoner. Verse 39 indicates that those who passed by Jesus' cross derided and mocked him. Verse 12. I have been forgotten like one who is dead, I have become like a broken vessel. David reports his enemies had convinced friends and neighbors to shun him, Psalm 31 verse 11. Perhaps his associates were afraid to be caught up in physical attacks on David, 1 Samuel 19 verse 2, 22 verse 17, Psalm 54 verse 3. Or David's critics might have spread lies and rumors, Psalm 31 verses 13 and 18, 38 verse 12, 59 colon 12. In English, those who pretend a despised person doesn't even exist make that person dead to them. In this verse, David experiences that feeling of being rejected as if he were already dead and forgotten. He also felt like a broken container, useless and tossed aside. Persecution made him feel destitute and worthless. However, no believer should feel this way. God never abandons a believer. He has promised to be with his children always, Hebrews 13 verse 5. Furthermore, so long as he or she breathes, a believer has something to accomplish for the Lord.
This is why it's important for believers to run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12 verses 1-2. The Apostle Paul is a sterling example of doing God's will to the very end. He writes in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. At the end of the race every faithful believer will receive the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. Verse 13. For I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side. As they scheme together against me as they plot to take my life. Persecution can come in a variety of forms, including physical torment and lies or slander, both of which David seems to have experienced. His enemies certainly tried to kill him, 1 Samuel 19 verse 2, 22 verse 17, Psalm 54 verse 3. In this passage, it appears they also lied to convince friends and neighbors to turn their backs on him, Psalm 38 verse 12, 59 colon 12. The evil, whispering, David mentions here might include smears on his reputation as well as plans for his death. Centuries later, the prophet Jeremiah would experience the same struggles described by David in this passage. Jeremiah was extremely unpopular because he predicted disaster for Judah. He writes in Jeremiah 20 verse 10, I hear many whispering. Terror is on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. David and Jeremiah were not the only ones to receive such vile treatment. Jesus, too, was the object of similar abuse. Mark 3 verse 6 states, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. The Apostle Paul was another object of sinister plotting. The Jews in Damascus plotted to kill him. Acts 9 verse 24 reports, they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. The Sanhedrin also plotted to assassinate him, twice, Acts 23 verses 12-15, 25-3. Verse 14. But I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God. This verse begins with the word, but, creating contrast with the previous passage. Earlier, David noted his dire circumstances. Enemies plotted to kill him. Friends and neighbors turned their backs, Psalm 31 verses 11 to 13. Despite physical and emotional pain, conviction of sin, reproach, and rejection, David still trusts in the Lord. Adverse circumstances can come in many forms. Persecution, distress, and a feeling of rejection and aloneness may almost crush a believer, but the Lord will never forsake him. He can say with David, You are my God. With God on his side, David could feel victorious over every harsh circumstance. Every believer can feel victorious despite painful situations. Paul explains to the Romans that everything is working for good for those who love God, Romans 8 verses 28-30. Therefore, believers can look forward to victory over the hardest of experiences and exclaim, In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us, Romans 8 verse 37. As Paul affirms, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 verse 31. Context Summary Psalm 31 verses 14-22 comes after David expressed sorrow over persecution and abandonment. Despite hardship, David tells God he still trusts in him. He regarded the Lord as the foundation of his confidence. David asks the Lord to be forgiving and merciful, preserving him from the enemies who have attacked him. This passage celebrates God's forgiving nature, while looking back on prior instances of rescue. Verse 15. My times are in your hand, rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. David committed himself to God. He trusted God with his life and believed the Lord would not allow him to perish at the hands of his enemies, Psalm 31 verses 11-13. God would decide the time and way his life would end. Of course, that does not mean David had no preference, 
he did not want his enemies to snuff out his life. So, he prays for rescue from those persecuting him. No one can predict exactly when his life will end. All anyone can do is commit their life to God and leave the time and way of death to the Lord's plans. Jesus faced a cruel, violent, abhorrent death on the cross. Yet, he committed himself to the will of the Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane Jesus prayed, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will, Matthew 26 verse 39. Every believer can and should commit their life to God and rest with confidence in His will, see Romans 12 verses 1-2. Verse 16. Make your face shine on your servant, save me in your steadfast love. In the ancient Middle East, references to a shining face implied joy and happiness. Even today, in modern English, we say that a face showing intense happiness is beaming. God causing his face to shine on someone implied his favor and blessing. This turn of phrase blended well with the Hebrew concept of light as the embodiment of truth and goodness. The idea of God shining his face, thus bringing a blessing, was a major component in Aaron's designated blessing for Israel, Numbers 6 27. Other psalms echo the same imagery, Psalm 4 verse 6, 67 verse 1, 80 colon 3. Although he was anointed to be king, David identifies himself as the Lord's servant. Humility is a virtue every believer should possess. It's an especially crucial attitude when approaching God in prayer. Even a king of people on earth should humbly recognize how finite and dependent he is on the king of the universe. David asks not only for God's undeserved favor, but also for deliverance from his enemies, Psalm 31 verses 11 to 15. His plea for rescue is grounded in faith in the Lord's unfailing love. Victory over harsh circumstances and persecution is possible only because the Lord is gracious and loving. Verse 17. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you, let the wicked be put to shame, let them go silently to Sheol. David asks the Lord to not allow him to experience shame. This is more than emotion, it is also an expression that means being defeated and struck down. It would certainly be humiliating and disastrous if David fell victim to his enemies and forfeited his crown. Yet his trust in the Lord is clear. David bases his desire for vindication on the fact that he was calling upon the Lord. Rather than being the one to experience defeat and disgrace, shame, David asks that the Lord bring that fate to his enemies. He asks also that their fate be accompanied by silence. In earlier verses David noted that his enemies were whispering plots and schemes, Psalm 31 verse 13. The Lord could silence them by consigning them to the realm of the dead. In Psalm 63 verse 7 David testifies how the Lord has helped him, so he will sing joyfully under that protection. He also writes, Those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth, Psalm 63 verse 9. Someday, the Lord will judge the wicked, consigning them forever to endless suffering in the lake of fire, Revelation 20 verses 10 to 15. Verse 18. Let the lying lips be mute which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. In prior verses, David noted that his enemies were whispering plots against him, Psalm 31 verse 13. These were probably physical threats as well as slander and lies. These caused even friends and neighbors to avoid David, Psalm 31 verses 11 to 12. As part of his prayer for deliverance, David asks for God to silence these enemies, Psalm 31 verse 17. He asks God to turn those deceitful words into silence. He wants his enemies to become like those who cannot speak. Further, David mentions that his enemies also make arrogant attacks on other godly people. Not only did his foes hate him, but they also despised anyone who was godly. Their evil insults against David and righteous others indicate that they despised the Lord. David associates this kind of hateful speech with pride and contempt. 
it is ultimately pride that causes wicked people to oppose the Lord and His people. Such arrogance places them squarely in the devil's camp. The devil epitomized pride by seeking to usurp God and place himself on God's throne. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High, Isaiah 14 verse 14. In response, God will bring the devil, down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit, Isaiah 14 verse 15. Verse 19. Oh, how abundant is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. David praises the Lord's lavish goodness. He does not place a measure on God's goodness, because it is immeasurable. It extends far beyond our need. His goodness abounds in times of trial as well as in times of plenty. Paul writes in Romans 5 verse 17 about the abundance of grace. He also states, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, Romans 5 verse 20. According to David, God's goodness is not merely plentiful, it is also always stockpiled and ready. This goodness, David says, is there for those who reverence God. The believer does not have to worry that the Lord's goodness will suddenly run out. Those who reverence Him also trust in Him for protection. David views the Lord's goodness as available for those who take refuge in the Lord. Nahum 1 verse 7 affirms, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, He knows those who take refuge in Him. Verse 20. In the cover of your presence you hide them from the plots of men, you store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. Verse 21. Blessed be the Lord, for He has wondrously shown His steadfast love to Muhan I was in a besieged city. David extols the Lord, saying God had wondrously shown unfailing love. He connects his praise to what seems to be a specific event, being trapped under a siege. The city may have been Keilah, 1 Samuel 23 verses 1-15, or Ziklag, 1 Samuel 30. It may even refer to Jerusalem. At one point, David's son Absalom and his followers, including David's counselor, Ahithophel, sought to overthrow him, 2 Samuel 17 verses 1-14. Yet in all these situations, David survived to continue serving God's will. Wisely, David acknowledges that the Lord loved him even when he experienced grave danger. The Lord's divine love is constant, whether skies are fair or when skies darken, thunder rolls, and lightning flashes. Paul testifies in Romans 8 verse 39 that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 22. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. Trusting in God does not make a person completely immune to all fear. Some moments in David's life were extremely dangerous. Among those were being trapped in besieged cities and being pursued by enemies, 1 Samuel 23 verses 1 to 15, 2 Samuel 15, 18. David admits that in some of those moments, he was greatly afraid. He wondered if God had abandoned him. However, no believer is ever left outside of God's watchful care. He even sees the sparrows fall and knows the number of hairs on each believer's head, Matthew 10 verses 29-30. Jesus said, Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows, Matthew 10 verse 31. A believer may face what appears to be an impossible situation, but eventually the Lord comes to the rescue. Pursued by the Egyptians, the Hebrews faced a humanly impossible situation. They were at the edge of the Red Sea and the Egyptian cavalry was bearing down on them. Only the Lord could rescue them, and He did so. He carved a path through the Red Sea so His chosen people could cross safely. When the Egyptians tried to follow, their chariots got stuck and the horsemen drowned, Exodus 14. Facing his humanly impossible situation, David cried out to the Lord for help, and the Lord came to his rescue. Verse 23. Love the Lord, 
All you his saints, the Lord preserves the faithful but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. After explaining his approach to trust in God, Psalm 31 verses 19-22, David turns his attention to the believers in Israel. He exhorts them to love the Lord. This exhortation echoes the first and greatest commandment the Lord gave the people of Israel. He announced, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. Jesus said, This is the great and first commandment, Matthew 22 verse 38. David assures the faithful that God preserves them. In other words, He protects and keeps them. He gives them grace to endure every affliction, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, and He escorts them safely to heaven, John 10 verse 28. On the other hand, God serves justice to proud evildoers, in abundance. A famous illustration of this is Jesus' story about a beggar named Lazarus, who was transported to paradise, as opposed to an unrighteous rich man, who died and suffered in hell, Luke 16 verses 19-23. Unbelievers may prosper in this life, but they will experience the same judgment as anyone else after they die, Hebrews 9 verse 27. Context Summary Psalm 31 verses 23-24 closes the song of praise with a call to worship. After explaining God's prior rescue, and asking for deliverance, David encourages others. Those who love God should humbly rest in the Lord's power, allowing that trust to bring courage. Verse 24. Be strong, and let your heart take courage all you who wait for the Lord. David's final words in Psalm 31 exhort the faithful to be purposeful and brave as they place all their trust in God. This resembles the exhortation the Lord gave Joshua as he was about to lead the Israelites into Canaan. There, they would face giants and fortified cities. Yet God told Joshua, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, Joshua 1 verse 9. Life is full of challenges. Ill health can grip the believer at any moment. Persecution is certain, John 16 verse 33, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. Various trials bring stress and pressure to the believer. However, those who rely on God and trust His timing find strength for every challenge, James 1 verses 2-4, 1 Peter 1 verses 6-9, for colon 12 14. Waiting on the Lord involves praying and trusting. It also involves watching for the return of our faithful Lord, who promised, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me, to repay each one for what he has done, Revelation 22 verse 12. End of Psalm 31 Please note the material used in this post, video is from biblareef.com which is from God Questions Ministries and is posted here to be read by Immersive Reader in the Edge browser. If you copy this material please follow these rules. Content from biblareef.com may not be used for any commercial purposes, or as part of any commercial work, without explicit prior written consent from God Questions Ministries. Any use of our material should be properly credited, please make it clear the content is from biblareef.com. Bibleref.com content may not be altered, modified, or otherwise changed unless such changes are specifically noted.